Well, we did it. 200 question shows. Like when you do some rough math at like 10 questions per show, it's like 2000 questions answered. I mean, half are about Lagrange points, but still the other half are a wide collection of questions about space and astronomy, space exploration. And as we were approaching the 200th episode, I thought I should do something special. And I thought it would be really cool to take your questions and pass them around to a bunch of my friends who are also space YouTubers. So I put out the call. I got a great response from a lot of famous and less famous, but still excellent space YouTubers. And I asked you to send me your hardest questions, your brutal questions. And that's because I never plan to answer them. I plan to hand them along to other people. I'm going to put links in the show notes to everyone who answered a question here today so that you can subscribe to their channel. Do it. You're already subscribed to all their channels already. I know. Thank you everyone who sent in your questions and thanks in advance to all of the guest answerers who took on these questions. All right, let's get into the questions. Kevin Slade. Regarding arrow breaking of the starship in the Martian atmosphere, the thinness of the atmosphere is stated to be insufficient to slow down the craft to similar speeds as on Earth. My question is, can't control surfaces be used to keep starship passing through the atmosphere and around Mars for as long as is necessary to bleed off as much velocity as possible to reduce fuel consumption in the landing burn? That's a great question, and it sounds like the perfect question for Scott Manley. Why can't it? Well, that's exactly what it's doing. So let's just explain what's actually happening here. I have a nice little model of Starship, although it is a somewhat old version with three fins. Now, when you're entering the atmosphere from deep space, you don't go straight down because the atmosphere is actually relatively thin and you will run out of atmosphere before you hit the ground. Instead, you come in at a very low angle skimming through the outside and controlling your descent, taking advantage of the extra time from the low angle of attack. Now, with Starship, it can control its descent. It can fly itself aerodynamically to make sure that it doesn't fall into the ground or fly up into space. So if you think, right, this is the position of maximum drag if it's going like this. But if it needs to get, say, a little bit of lift to counteract gravity, then it can angle itself a bit like this. And that will mean it goes upwards a little, but it suffers a little less drag. And of course it can change this angle, allowing itself to slow down less and get more lift or vice versa. The other thing it can do to maneuver is as it's going down range, it can rotate one way to push it in this direction, or it can rotate like that to push it in the other. And say it was getting a bit high, it could actually go point its nose downwards and in this orientation, right, they would actually push it downwards. Maybe it was going faster than orbital velocity and it needed to counteract the natural tendency to fly off into space. It could actually enter the atmosphere like this and stay inside, hold itself down until it bled off enough speed that the gravity would start to fall down, start to pull it out. So as long as it's moving sideways through the atmosphere, it can convert some of its kinetic, of its horizontal speed into lift and counteract gravity and stop it falling down. But eventually it gets to a point where it's not moving sideways quickly enough and it will begin basically falling down. And ideally it eliminates all of its horizontal velocity and it's only falling straight down. At that point, well, it can't do anything. It doesn't have any excess energy left. It is entirely slave to the force of gravity. Now on Mars, the force of gravity is about one third that of the Earth. The atmosphere is, let's just say 1%. So that's a factor of 33 times um, you know, difference. Now uh, the actual speed goes as a square root of this. So there's a difference of five to six in terms of the actual uh, you know, terminal velocity, the speed at which it will fall at. On Earth, it probably fell, I don't know, I think it fell probably about 100 meters per second right at the end before it began its transition to vertical. So, you know, 600 meters per second, it's not quite Mach 2, but it's definitely supersonic. That's a fair amount of speed for it to bleed off, but it can't do any better than that, right? Once it's maneuvered into this straight belly flop, there's nothing left for it to take advantage of. 
Now, Starship isn't the only spacecraft that can maneuver through re-entry like this. At Perseverance, Curiosity, those have circular heat shields, and you might think that a circular heat shield, it's symmetric, it doesn't have a preferred axis, but they actually come with weights that sit on one side, and just before entry, they drop these weights, and that pushes the center of mass over a little, so it will tend to skid in one direction, depending upon what orientation it's in. So they will steer these probes through the re-entry by turning the heat shield, rolling around its axis, and that lets them steer to control their altitude and also help them reach their final launch site. So yeah, re-entry on, or sorry, it's not even re-entry. Entry into the Martian atmosphere is an incredibly complicated process and you do want to maneuver because a purely ballistic entry with no maneuvering would very quickly reach the surface and yeah, you would then have to spend a lot more propellant to slow down. So I hope that at least provided some more uh, information on your answer, uh, on your question. You can of course come over and watch some of my videos. I have a great video on uh, the heat shield of Starship and a whole video on aerothermodynamics, which is the process of aerodynamics with all the extra heat of re-entry. Lots to learn there. I uh, hope you will come and join me. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. David Zuba. The 1967 Outer Space Treaty banned using nuclear weapons in space, but it caused plans for the atomic spaceship Orion to be scrubbed. If built on orbit, couldn't a similar design be utilized with the Aldrin Cycler for continuous resupplies of manned missions to Mars? Good question. This sounds like one from Marcus House. Hey, hey, thanks Fraser for the invite. Super stoked that I get to provide my thoughts on the question here by David, trying to avoid a shameless plug here, but we are literally working on a video right now that uses a nuclear engine propelled Mars cycler just as an example. Firstly, avoiding atomic weapons in space is something that seems well, obviously beneficial, doesn't it? But being able to use nuclear propulsion for pretty much anything that operates outside of the Van Allen radiation belts, I think is quite crucial, particularly for spacecraft which never descend down into another gravity well. Um, with the current technologies, it's probably the best chance that we've got for more efficient travel, um, simply due to the much higher specific impulse. But there are more crazy concepts like the Orion Drive, which could be better still, but there would need to be a lot of testing in that. I'm not convinced that it would ever really be considered safe enough. All of this really makes sense for huge vehicles though, because the mass of the engines and the associated shielding is really quite large. And I think concepts such as a Mars Cycler, like you're mentioning here, is really a perfect example of a large vehicle, a truly safe crude habitat that's intending to have interplanetary travel. Um, it, it's just going to be massive. You need to account for the adequate radiation shielding and ideally the entire thing needs to be big enough to incorporate some kind of rotating artificial gravity for the crew. With anything that big, nuclear propulsion seems pretty much necessary, assuming that we haven't invented some more exotic propulsion methods by then. Anyway, thanks for the invite, Fraser, and you know, thanks for having me on the show. Smee Self. Stars are said to be unlikely to ever collide in a galactic merger. Why then is the merger of supermassive black holes in their center often spoken about? Are they not even less likely to intersect? Great question, and I'm going to pass this one along to Christian Reddy from Launchpad Astronomy. The short answer is we don't fully know why or how supermassive black holes can merge during galaxy collisions. It may seem a little bit counterintuitive because we just assume that eventually the supermassive black holes should find their way together and eventually merge into an even bigger supermassive black hole. Now you are right that stars don't tend to collide during galaxy collisions because they're extremely tiny and space is so vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big. But the black holes at the center of these galaxies should be expected to find their way toward each other. After all, they occupy the centers of mass of their host galaxies, and they should find themselves close to the center of mass of the colliding system. However, the fact that they would spiral in toward each other is fine at first, but it turns out that if you do all the math and calculations, you discover that they should suddenly stop moving toward each other. In fact, once these black holes arrive to within about a parsec of each other, their orbits stabilize, and we don't really have a viable mechanism to get them to spiral in any closer. 
This is called the final parsec problem. Now, stellar mass black holes can certainly spiral in toward each other because they're a lot lighter and they can easily find each other under the pull of their relative gravities. But supermassive black holes carry a tremendous amount of angular momentum. They're extremely massive, they're moving very quickly, they're not inclined to change their orbits. So how do these massive black holes begin to approach each other in the first place? Well, this usually involves a third body interaction. Typically, a star or several stars will find themselves flying between the two black holes. As they do so, they accelerate under the black hole's gravity and can find themselves getting ejected out of the colliding galaxies. In the process, they steal away some of the black hole's orbital momentum and they spiral in a little bit closer. But all of the models and calculations show that by the time they get to within a parsec of each other, there just isn't enough stuff left to steal away enough angular momentum. Now you might be thinking, well, maybe gravitational waves can do this. Well, that is true when the black holes are very close to each other. But these supermassive black holes generate gravitational waves of extremely low frequency. We're talking nanohertz frequencies. And that's just not strong enough to rob the black holes of any energy until they are extremely close together. And so we're left with this final parsec problem. Now there are some hypotheses as to how this could be resolved. Perhaps the two black holes bring with them so many stars that there's enough of them to interfere with the system even when the two black holes are close together. Or maybe the black holes have enough surrounding gas that once ejected can finally drive them close enough together. It's not yet clear, and this is why we're so glad to have telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope, which can now finally reveal to us a lot of the goings on around active black holes that would otherwise be enshrouded in gas and dust. Now, if you're into JWST, feel free to check out my channel. I've made a few videos, so feel free to have a look. Thanks for the question, and I hope that we will get a more definitive answer soon. Until then, stay curious, my friend. Victor Riley. Quantum mechanics says the wave function of two entangled particles collapses for both simultaneously, but special relativity says simultaneity is dependent on the reference frame of the observer. In whose reference frame do the wave functions collapse simultaneously? I definitely need to bring in an expert for this question. So here's Sabina Hossenfelder. That's an absolutely brilliant question. First of all, it's entirely correct. According to quantum mechanics, if you have two entangled particles in two separate places and you observe one of them, then the wave function of the other one collapses instantaneously. This happens faster than the speed of light. And as Victor points out, whether it's simultaneous depends on the reference frame. This collapse of the wave function is what Albert Einstein called spooky action at a distance. He didn't like it at all because it conflicts with the basic principles of his theories. I want to add here that the phrase spooky action at a distance is often mistakenly used for entanglement itself. But there's nothing spooky in the entanglement. It's just a type of correlation. The spooky thing that's going on is the instantaneous collapse. The two things, the entanglement and collapse, have become mixed up, I believe, because entangled particles are often used to explain why wave function collapse is weird. However, the same problem with the instantaneous collapse occurs already for single particles. And indeed, a single particle without entanglement is the context in which Einstein originally used the phrase spukhafte Fernwirkung, spooky action at a distance. But the collapse of the wave function is completely unobservable. The only thing we actually observe is the measurement outcome. This means, for what observations are concerned, there are some reference frames in which the measurement was made first on the one particle and some other reference frames in which it was first made on the other particle. That's not in conflict with special relativity. The process that's in conflict with special relativity is one that we can't measure. There's about a century debate in the scientific literature about what this means. Does it mean that the wave function isn't real? Or does it mean that quantum mechanics is non-local? Or does it mean that quantum mechanics is wrong? 
Personally, I think it means that the collapse of the wave function is just an approximation for another physical process that respects Einstein's speed of light limit, but that we haven't yet discovered. Brewy 100. We have some weird stuff in the universe, such as black holes, quasars, neutron stars, magnetars, dark matter, etc., etc. What even weirder stuff is theorized to exist or at least speculated? Okay, that sounds like a question for Joe Scott. So the list of things that we can theorize as people is pretty much infinite because we have pretty big imaginations, but there are some that I thought were interesting enough to highlight, so uh, let's talk about those now. Okay, so the first thing you got is a ghost galaxy. So a ghost galaxy is basically a galaxy made out of dark matter, so also sometimes they're called dark galaxies. Or maybe it's not entirely made of dark matter. Uh, it may have normal stars in it, but so few of them you can barely see them. So some have speculated that um, it's a galaxy that is in its earliest stages of star formation, that it just some, kind of somehow lost all the gas and dust that it takes to form new stars. So it's kind of like a skeleton of its early development because it started making stars and then lost all the stuff to make stars. Um, there are a few potential dark matter galaxies that have been found, uh, but none of them have been fully confirmed or anything. One is called Dragonfly 44, um, and it's 99% dark matter. It's about the same size as the Milky Way, but it only has a handful of stars in it. So it's mostly just dark matter holding everything together. It's really weird. Um, astronomers are investigating it and hopefully, who knows, it might lead to a breakthrough in our understanding of dark matter. So those are dark galaxies. Then there's the white hole. Um, I did a video about white holes a while back and maybe first you'll put the link down below, but white holes are basically like black holes in reverse. So like instead of pulling matter in, it spews matter out. So these are purely theoretical, but uh, the thinking as I understand it goes that, you know, like if forces exist to pull matter together so tight that it becomes, you know, encoded information or a singularity, then maybe that process can be reversed. So some people even suggest the white holes or something like it could be, you know, the explanation for dark energy. Like they're what's expanding the universe by pumping out space time into it all the time. Uh, some also like to speculate that maybe every black hole creates a white hole somewhere else in the universe. And that's kind of where all that black hole matter goes. Um, I've even argued, this is kind of my own little weird idea, but you know, that maybe a black hole punches through to another time reversed universe made out of antimatter, where instead of being perceived as, as spewing outward into that universe to them, it looks like it's falling inward into a black hole because they're traveling backwards in time. And the same would be for us, uh, vice versa. But uh, I have a wild imagination. Don't, don't put any stock in that. The next one we can talk about is a black dwarf. You've heard of brown dwarfs. This is a black dwarf. So um, you've also probably heard of white dwarfs. That's kind of like an end of life stage uh, star. Uh, it usually follows a supernova. A black dwarf is basically a white dwarf that's kind of gone out. So it's or it's or it's cooled off to the point that a crust is formed on top of it. So it's not emitting light or heat anymore. Um, and this makes sense. You know, the, the problem is that white dwarfs, white dwarf stars, they they burn for a really long time. Like like a really long time, like trillions of years. So it's totally likely that um, it's just theoretically possible for a white dwarf to become a black dwarf, but we'll probably never see one because it just takes that long for it to happen. Um, or there may be some out there, but we'll never actually see it because we have no way of seeing it because it's literally just a black rock in empty space. It's not emitting anything that we can perceive. So then you've got strange stars or quark stars. So. Okay, so if you're a star and you go supernova, you might collapse down to a white dwarf, like I was just talking about. Um, if you're a much bigger star, you might collapse down to a black hole. And you know, if you're somewhere in between those two sizes of stars, you might collapse down to a neutron star where the gravitational pull is so strong that it kind of crushes the atoms and forces protons and electrons together in neutrons, and it makes a neutron star, just a, just a dense mass of neutrons. A, a teaspoon is where, you know, weighs like a million tons. It's ridiculous physics and whatnot. But anyway, well, it's thought that somewhere between a neutron star and a black hole that maybe you could crush down past the point of the neutron to the quarks that make up the neutron. So, so you're just smashing down another level. So you're creating a star made out of quarks. So quark star. And a, a strange quark is a type of quark, so sometimes they're called strange stars. But these have been just purely theoretical, but they may have actually found one a month ago in a supernova remnant called Hess J1731347. It's a very sexy name and I had to just read that for you. But long story short, this is either the smallest neutron star ever detected or it could be a quark star. They're still trying to figure that out. 
And just to complete this whole train of thought, there are theoretical particles that are thought to make up quarks called prions. So um, along with that is the theoretical possibility of a, a prion star, a, a star that crushes down past quarks into prions. But I guess I get in on a pretty obvious one, and that's Planet Nine or uh, Planet X, whatever you want to call it. There has been a theorized unknown planet out there for a long time. Like back when they discovered Neptune and were able to calculate its orbit, they saw that there were some weird anomalies in their orbit that didn't seem to be making any sense unless there was an extra planet. That's exactly what they were looking for when they found Pluto. Pluto, of course, is not nearly strong enough to do that. So um, this has been a, an idea that's been floated around for a really long time. But in 2015, researchers from Caltech published a paper that, that showed mathematically what a planet nine would look like. Uh, they described it as being about 10 times the size of Earth, and its orbit would go out 20 times further than Neptune. Um, and it's in a very highly elliptical orbit that lasts up to 10 to 20,000 years. And it's thought that maybe when it passes through, it might stir up the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt, which might actually explain some anomalous, you know, asteroids and comets that have been observed in our solar system. Um, but what has not been observed is planet nine itself, but maybe someday. So those are some of the weird things out there that we've imagined over the years that I've been able to come up with. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit anyway. Hope you enjoyed it. Back to Fraser. Dana Freer, is it possible that dark matter is just ordinary matter that we can't see? I'm going to pass this question along to Dr. Maggie Liu. So the question is, is it possible that dark matter is just ordinary matter that we can't see? And that is a really great question. Scientists have been suspecting this too for many years. One of the best candidates that we had for dark matter was brown dwarfs. And these are essentially failed stars. They're not big enough to have nuclear fusion happening in their cores. So they can't convert hydrogen into helium. And so they can't shine like stars do, like our sun does. We can, however, sometimes see them in other wavelengths, like in X-ray and radio wavelengths. It's estimated that there is approximately one brown dwarf per four or more massive stars. But we expect dark matter to make up about 85% of the mass in our universe. So brown dwarfs are unlikely to account for all of the dark matter out there. Dark matter shouldn't emit any light at all, and it shouldn't interact with light either, so it can't obscure it. All ordinary matter, which we call baryonic matter, that we know of, will emit some kind of radiation, even if it's not in visible wavelengths. So that rules out brown dwarfs, dust, anything in between, being dark matter. Another candidate that you might think would be black holes. We believe that there are supermassive black holes at the center of every galaxy. But most black holes form from the remnants of a large star that died in a supernova explosion. There are not enough of these black holes to account for all dark matter that we know of. Primordial black holes are those that have formed in the early universe. These could be abundant enough to account for the mass in the universe, but we don't see gravitational lensing effects that these objects would come with. These are the effects of light distortion of galaxies that would be behind these primordial black holes. We'd see them as like arcs, we'd see like deflections of light. Our best evidence so far tells us that dark matter isn't baryonic, it's not ordinary matter. The theory of Big Bang nucleosynthesis predicts the abundance of elements in the universe. There is just too much deuterium, a type of hydrogen, for the universe to be made completely of ordinary matter. Most of it should have been converted into helium-4. Also, a universe made of just ordinary matter would look much more clumpy on large scales than what we see. So is dark matter ordinary matter? It's very unlikely to be so. It might contribute to some of the dark matter content, but definitely not all of it. Rajiv Gungal, how do we democratize astronomy? While biology has DNA kits, we are still stuck at telescopes. Any other instrumentation that can excite? I'll pass this question along to one of my favorite astronomer friends, Dylan O'Donnell. Thanks, Fraser, and great question, Rajiv. Of course, the difference between astronomy and biology is that biology is right here. A biology is right on our doorstep. You can go outside and dissect a frog, or murder a grasshopper, 
or put your own bodily fluids on a microscope slide and check that out. It's literally on our doorstep. Everything in space is by definition very, very far, far away. So we need telescopes and spacecraft to physically directly engage with astronomy. It's my opinion though that astronomy as a science is generally targeted maybe a little too much at children and we have this big focus on tiny little telescopes that introduce children to astronomy but with very underwhelming views. A lot of kids will see those little point sources of light in the sky instead of the big photo of Jupiter and Saturn on the box and be a little underwhelmed. Not all kids, some kids like me, end up on a lifelong journey in astronomy. But for a lot of people, those sorts of views lack the gravity, pun intended, of what's really out there. It's a really awe-inspiring and fascinating topic that I really love, so I want to share that gravity with other people. Real revolution that's been happening to democratize astronomy for the greater population is the revolution in digital cameras. Smartphones particularly have driven innovation in CMOS sensor chips so that now we have chips that are smaller and more low light sensitive and more capable than ever before. And the images that we're seeing now from backyard astronomers rival those of the experts only 10 years ago. For some smartphones, you can even just hand hold a Milky Way photo and it will do all the image processing and stacking and will look just like an image of the Milky Way that you would have taken with a professional camera a decade ago. There are even patents for periscope style camera assemblies inside a smartphone so that they can achieve a longer focal length and zoom in further. Couple that with the fact that you have this image pipeline processing built in internally into the camera for low light situations that will do image registration and stacking and you're not getting far away from what astronomers are doing now already when they're doing image processing for astrophotography. So I think, watch this space, soon everyone will have a device in their pocket that gives them a direct physical connection to space and that's something that I think even biologists would be jealous of. So Yapa Jimenez. I've been thinking, if the universe is so vulnerable constantly and so far impossible for us to have another Mother Earth, wouldn't it be better to think about how to build colonies in empty space? It's a great futurism question, and that's a good question for Isaac Arthur. Hello, I'm Isaac Arthur from Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, where we do a weekly half-hour show on concepts ranging from space colonization and robotics to energy technology post-scarcity civilizations, and realism in science fiction. That's an excellent question and one we discuss on the show a lot as an alternative to colonizing new planets and living under domes while we terraform them. Would it be easier to build space colonies? It's hard to say until we've terraformed a few planets and built a few space habitats, but at the moment it would seem like you could build space habitats with conditions inside them much more like what we've already got on Earth. Through rotation we can emulate gravity, what we call spin gravity, to be whatever we wish, Earth-like or lighter or heavier, instead of being stuck with the gravity a planet will have on it, which would rarely be as close to Earth, and the same applies to length and brightness of the day, which we can tailor on space habitats. Mars has a gravity far weaker than Earth's, and a day a bit longer, and the Sun is weaker there. Alternatively, Venus has brighter days with each lasting many months, even if the gravity is closer to that of Earth. We don't know if humans and other flora and fauna from Earth will take water conditions even if they're only 10% different, but there won't be many worlds where the gravity, day length, and brightness all come to within 10% of Earth's, especially in all three categories at once, but on a space habitat we can make all three come in within less than 1%. There are many other conditions that are easy to control inside a rotating space habitat, such as an O'Neill cylinder, and it takes far less raw materials to build a plant with a living space out of such cylinders than it does to make a planet. So disassembling asteroids, moons, and minor planets that could never be terraformed to be even vaguely Earth-like seems like it would be an easier way to make a new living area. On the other hand, a planet is already made, and there are many ways to alter them to be more habitable, including options like orbital solar mirrors and shades to bring more or less light in a daylight pattern, and that's a topic we spent a lot of time delving into on my show, if you want to learn more. Again, great question, thanks, and have a great week. Arjon, what is the most low-tech, on-purpose techno-signature that we can hope to find or to leave? Classic Arjon question, and I'm going to give this one to John Michael Godier. This is a complicated question because it's situational. In a case where you know the exoplanet 
that you are attempting to uh, send a signal to, your best bet might be radio because you can do a targeted signal directly towards that planet. But if you do it in general, it becomes really expensive because you need an omnidirectional beacon that anybody in the galaxy can see, and you need to broadcast your message at very high power. So only in that specific instance where you can beam a very direct signal is it really very viable to use um, radio as a cheap techno signature. Now there are ideas on cheap techno, techno signatures, and one of them would be something called an Arnold Louver. This from a paper by a French astronomer, Luke Arnold, uh, years ago. And he, what he did was propose that you put up a giant baffle of some type, some unnaturally shaped baffle, like a giant triangle or square or something like that, that moves in front of a star, causing a very, very distinctive light curve that could be detected by any civilization that can see it that's within the line of sight. You know, and another variation, the, the idea was opening and closing louvers passing by. The viable way to do this is that you really don't need any crazy material to put up a big baffle like that. You just need something like mylar. So that might be a cheap way to do it. Another one is an idea that's been advanced by David Kipping of the Cold Worlds channel at Columbia University. And his idea was make your star green and that green colored stars don't exist in nature. Nature prohibits it. So what you do is you take a giant green filter and make your star green and that would tell everybody in the galaxy that you know <laughs> you're not alone but again this is this is a even though it's a cheap material in principle it's also a a mega project no matter what you do you're still building some kind of gigantic structure but those are the the cheapest ways to do it um now that it's also possible within techno signatures that they might do it in a way that we haven't envisioned and that we just simply don't know. All right. That was a lot of fun. Thank you everyone who sent in your tough questions and thanks to all of the special guest answers who chipped in and gave us an answer. It was a lot of fun to organize this 200th question show and here's to hundreds and hundreds more. I'll see you next week when we go back to our regular programming. You can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There's no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.